Welcome back to the AI Breakdown. Today we are talking about a topic which is coming up more and more, which is a question about whether we're seeing the first signs of the AI bubble pop, or at least show some serious signs of strain. The basis of this is that since November, with the launch of ChatGPT, everything surrounding AI has been just absolutely white hot. But it now feels like there are potentially some signs of waning interest or participation, and people are starting to wonder what it means. Now, where this really started to come up was about a week and a half ago, when someone noticed that ChatGPT had seen its first ever usage decline in the month of June. According to SimilarWeb, between May and June, ChatGPT's usage on both mobile and the web went down around 10%. It was the first time the company's numbers had gone down after a meteoric rise. However, as far back as March, the trend line had clearly shifted to a much more restrained pace of growth. Now, interestingly, SimilarWeb also showed March as being the peak for Bing, which had been on the slight downcline in each of the three subsequent months, while for Bard and Character.ai, their peaks had also been in May, coming down once again slightly in June. Now, mainstream media was very quick to jump on this and do a bit of narrative shaping. On July 7th, the Washington Post published, ChatGPT losing users for the first time is shaking faith in the AI revolution. The piece says, The drop-in usage suggests that the text limitations are catching up with it, and at least some of the hype around chatbots is overblown. Basically, this Washington Post paints the whole situation as one in which big tech has been just absolutely pumping up AI, only for people to finally realize that it's not all that impressive. And frankly, if you ever wanted to see an example of why tech doesn't really trust mainstream media, the conclusion that this piece jumps to after a single month of declining numbers, and the picture that it paints of mass disillusionment with this entire technology category, is just so emblematic of that frustration. If one possible explanation is that people are just not interested in ChatGPT anymore, another possible explanation that some have offered has to do with seasonality. Basically, the idea here is that one of the major uses of ChatGPT is education. With students not in session, it's kind of natural that the numbers would be falling. However, even with that explanation, some still say that that should be a cause for concern. Bernstein analyst Mark Schmulek said, If it's school kids, that's a real yellow-red flag on the size of its prize. The idea of the ChatGPT drop-off due to students and summer break implies a narrower audience and fewer use cases. Then, of course, making another massive leap in logic, Insider says, In other words, if a big part of ChatGPT growth is driven by cheating students, this means the technology, or at least the chatbot format, may not be the dominant computing platform of the future. Now, of course, there are other interpretations as well. Some of those interpretations might recognize that in the context of a product that went from 0 to 100 million users in five weeks, we just don't have a lot of precedent about how those growth curves are supposed to look. In fact, there is no supposed to because there isn't any precedent. The assumption here is that a 10% decline month over month means an existential crisis. However, that could equally be just the press looking for another story because laudatory articles around ChatGPT aren't driving clicks anymore. I also think that holding aside the arrogance and casual dismissiveness of assuming that students are only using ChatGPT to cheat, writing off the educational use case as suggesting that other use cases are too small overall fails to recognize how much young people and students are inherently going to get a new technology tool before their older peers and other sectors will. In other words, the percentage of ChatGPT's users today that may be made up by students is likely going to be much bigger than the total percentage of educational users in the future. That is by simple virtue of the fact that students are much more likely to be early adopters than are, say, their 40-plus-year-old peers. But regardless of this, the point is that it really got the whole bubble conversation happening, and it's now starting to show up in other places. I discussed this more in depth on today's AI Breakdown Brief, but last week, Stability AI CEO Ahmad Mostak was on a call with UBS analysts and said that on the one hand, while AI will be a $1 trillion investment opportunity, it will also produce the biggest bubble of all time, with, of course, investors chasing after things that don't end up ultimately working out. Which brings us, I think, to the most interesting part of the conversation and something new from the weekend we're starting to see the first sign of trouble show up at AI startups themselves. Over the weekend, the information ran a story about how Jasper and Mutiny, both AI startups, had been forced to recently cut workers. The piece reads, Two startups developing products using generative artificial intelligence laid off workers recently, striking a downbeat note amid a wave of investor euphoria for the sector. Jasper AI, which sells software that uses OpenAI's GPT to help businesses create and fix text, cut staff this week. And Mutiny, which sells software powered by AI to personalize and improve website text, cut about 30% of staff for around 30 jobs late last month. Now, of course, that inevitably leads to the question as to what extent this is about Jasper or Mutiny specifically versus a broader trend in AI generally. AI entrepreneur Sam Hogan had a really interesting post about this. He wrote, 
Six months ago, it looked like AI and LLMs were going to bring a much-needed revival to the venture startup ecosystem after a tough few years. With companies like Jasper starting to slow down, it's looking like this may not be the case. Right now, there are two clear winners, a handful of losers, and a small group of moonshots that seem promising. Let's start with the losers. Companies like Jasper and the VCs that back them are the biggest losers right now. Jasper raised $100 million at a 10-figure valuation for what is essentially a generic thin wrapper around OpenAI. Their UX and brand are good, but not great, and competition from companies building differentiated products specifically for high-value niches are making it very difficult to grow with such a generic product. I'm not sure how this pans out, but VCs will likely lose their money. The other category of losers are the VC-backed teams building at the application layer that raised 250 k to $25 million in December to March on the back of the chatbot craze, with the expectation that they would be able to sell to later stage and enterprise companies. These startups typically have products that are more focused than something very generic like Jasper, but still don't have a real technology moat. The products are easy to copy. Executives at enterprise companies are excited about AI and have been vocal about this from the beginning. This led a lot of founders and VCs to believe these companies would make good first customers. What the startups building for these companies failed to realize is just how aligned and savvy executives and the engineers they manage would be at quickly getting AI into production using open source tools. An engineering leader would rather spin up their own Langchain and Chroma infrastructure for free and build tech themselves than buy something from a new, unproven startup and maybe pick up a promotion along the way. In short, large companies are opting to write their own AI success stories rather than being a part of the growth metrics a new AI startup needs to raise their next round. This brings us to our first group of winners, established companies and market incumbents. Most of them had little trouble adding AI into their products or hacking together some sort of chat your docs application internally for employee use. This came as a surprise to me. Most of these companies seem to be asleep at the wheel for years. They somehow woke up and have been able to successfully navigate the LLM craze with ample dexterity. There are two causes for this. One, getting AI right is a life or death proposition for many of these companies and their executives. Failure here would mean a slow death over the next several years. They can't risk putting their future in the hands of a new startup that could fail and would rather lead projects internally to make absolutely sure things go as intended. Two, there is a certain amount of kick-ass wafting through the halls of the C-suite right now. Ambitious projects are being greenlit and supported in ways they weren't a few years ago. I think we owe this in part to Elon Musk reminding us of what is possible when a small group of smart people are highly motivated to get things done. Reduce red tape, increase personal responsibility, and watch the magic happen. Our second group of winners live on the opposite side of this spectrum, indie devs and solopreneurs. These small, often one-man outfits do not raise outside capital or build big teams. Their advantage is their small size and their ability to move very quickly with low overhead. They build niche products for niche markets, which they often dominate. The goal is to build a SaaS product or multiples that generates 10k a month in relatively passive income. This is sometimes called micro SaaS. These are the level CEO and Danny Postmas of the world. They are part software devs, part content marketers, and full-time modern internet businessmen. They answer to no one except markets and their own intuition. This is the biggest group of winners right now. Unconstrained by the need for a billion dollar exit or the goal of 100 million ARR, they build and launch products in rapid fire fashion, iterating until product market fit and cash flow and moving on to the next. They ruthlessly shut down products that are not performing. LLMs and text to image models a la Stable Diffusion have been a boon for these entrepreneurs, and I personally know dozens of successful, keeping in mind their definition of successful, apps that were started less than six months ago. The lifestyle and freedom these endeavors afford to those that perform well is also quite enticing. I think we'll continue to see the number of successful micro SaaS AI apps grow in the next 12 months. This could possibly become one of the biggest cohorts creating real value with this technology. The last group I want to talk about are the AI moonshots, companies that are fundamentally reimagining an entire industry from the ground up. Generally, these companies are VC-backed and building products that have the potential to redefine how a small group of highly skilled humans interact with and are assisted by technology. It's too early to tell if they'll be successful or not. Early prototypes have been compelling. This is certainly the most exciting segment to watch. A few companies I would put into this group are 1. Cursor.so, an AI-first code editor that could very well change how software is written. 2. Harvey.ai, AI for legal practices. 3. Runway ML, an AI-powered video editor. This is an incomplete list, but overall I think the moonshot category needs to grow massively if we're going to see the AI-powered future we've all been hoping for. If you're a founder in the 250k to 25 million raised category and are having a hard time finding product market fit for your chatbot or LLM ops company, it may be time to consider pivoting to something more ambitious. Let's recap. 1. VC-backed companies are having a hard time. The more money a company raised, the more pain they're feeling. 2. Incumbents and market leaders are quickly becoming adept at deploying cutting-edge AI using internal teams and open-source, off-the-shelf technology, cutting out what seem to be good opportunities for VC-backed startups. 3. Indie devs are building small, cash-flowing businesses by quickly shipping niche AI-powered products in niche markets. 4. A small number of promising moonshot companies with unproven technology hold the most potential for VC-sized returns. It's still early. The landscape will continue to change as new foundational models are released and toolchains improve. I'm sure you can find counterexamples to everything I've written here. 
So this is a super interesting thesis, and there is a lot to unpack here. I think trying to answer the question of to what extent these layoffs are a reflection of the AI bubble itself bursting versus a problem of these specific companies, this piece effectively argues that the AI venture model isn't playing out the way that many had thought, but it doesn't necessarily follow that AI itself is a bubble that has popped. Instead, Sam argues that there are two big unexpected factors that are changing the degree to which the traditional venture model is the right fit for this industry as it's evolving. The first is how much enterprise companies are actually building internally, and the second is the extent to which small and indie developers who are bootstrapping have been able to fill in the gaps of small niches because they don't have the pressure to return at a venture-backed scale. If anything, I think that the interesting takeaways from Sam have more to do with the changing nature of the venture industry than they do with AI. However, as Sam points out and starts off with, AI has been largely seen as the great savior for the venture capital space that, as he puts it, has had a rough couple years. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to venture capital, those rough couple years are kind of predicated upon a bigger shift, which is the withdrawal from a zero interest rate world. For more than a decade, venture capital was experiencing basically endless inflows of capital looking for yield, and now that's just not the case anymore. It's inevitable that models are going to have to change as that money flows out, and there's just less capital to go around. Anyways, it is a super interesting moment in the history of the evolution of this space, and one that we are definitely going to keep a very close eye on. For now, that is going to do it for today's AI Breakdown. If you enjoyed this and haven't done it yet, please go leave a five-star rating wherever you listen to the show, or whatever the equivalent is if your podcast app has a different system. I appreciate you guys listening as always, and until next time, peace.